April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany. Many ground troops had to be trained for fighting in France. It was also necessary to build a force to fight in the air. Not only were airplanes needed in large quantities, but men had to be trained to fly and maintain them. It wasn't long before hundreds of young flying cadets, wearing identifying white bands on their hats, began reporting to flying schools in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Ground school courses were designed to prepare the men for flight, aircraft construction, cockpit controls, control surfaces, armament, and the operation of machine guns. For men who were anxious to fly, it seemed as though the ground school classes would never end. But the day finally came when it was time to go up and apply what had been learned in ground school. Very few had ever ridden in an airplane, and the first flight was an experience that each cadet would remember in a different way. Initial flight training was directed by an instructor who flew in the front seat. His job was to teach the student the do's and don'ts of flying, such as how a plane got into a tailspin, and how to recover safely before crashing. The big moment came when it was time to go up alone, the first solo flight. After a few words of both caution and encouragement from the instructor, the cadet took off alone for a short flight around the airfield. Then came the most hazardous part, the first solo landing. A three-point landing on the first solo flight was more luck than skill. The student continued to fly, both with and without an instructor, gaining experience and confidence. Much time was devoted to flying single-seat planes in preparation for combat duty at the front. Finally, graduation day arrived. They'd earned their wings. While pilots were needed to fly the planes, many men were needed to maintain both engines and planes. Their responsibility would be to keep the airplanes in top flying and fighting condition. Pilots had the highest respect for their ground crews, knowing that their chance for survival was increased by their efforts. The first American squadron to fly combat was the 103rd Aero Squadron, formed from the famous Lafayette Escadrille. They began combat flights as the 103rd in February of 1918. Two months later, the United States began sending additional squadrons to the front. Two fighter units, the 94th and 95th Aero Squadrons, flew obsolescent Newport 28s purchased from France. The 94th scored its first two victories over a relatively inactive sector near Toul, France on April 14, 1918. When the 27th and 147th Aero Squadrons arrived at Toul, the four units were organized into the famous First Pursuit Group. Additional fighter squadrons sent to the front in the summer of 1918 were flying the latest French-built plane, the SPAD-13. SPADs were also assigned to the First Pursuit Group, replacing their older Newport 28s. The highly regarded SPADs made it possible for the American pilots to meet the enemy on equal terms. Almost daily, American fighter units also crossed the lines to look for enemy planes and observation balloons. Along the British front, which extended to the English Channel, 
two American fighter squadrons were flying with the Royal Air Force. These two units, the 17th and 148th Aero Squadrons, flying British Sopwith Camel airplanes, were pitted repeatedly against some of Germany's top fighter units. The Americans compiled an impressive record against them. America's first observation squadrons began combat by flying antiquated AR-1 airplanes. The situation was remedied in April 1918, when the United States Air Service purchased a most capable observation plane from France, the Samson. The observer rode in the rear cockpit and was provided with two flexible machine guns to defend against attack. The Salmson was used to spot enemy troop concentrations and movements, photograph enemy targets, direct artillery fire, and maintain surveillance of the enemy's rear areas. Flying deep into German territory, the Salmson frequently came under air attack by enemy fighters. The United States Air Service also used captive balloons for observing the enemy. Suspended in the air immediately behind the American lines, the balloons were highly vulnerable to attack by enemy fighter planes. The United States obtained its first bombing airplane from France. Called the Breguet, it looked awkward, but it was strongly constructed and could fly high and fast with a full load of bombs. It was used to attack railroad yards, supply depots, and troop concentrations far behind the enemy lines. The American-built DH-4 began arriving at the front in appreciable numbers in August of 1918. Most of them were built in Dayton, Ohio, and a total of 1,213 was shipped to overseas squadrons. 543 of the American DH-4 saw combat action before the cessation of hostilities. They were powered by the famous Liberty engine and served a dual role assigned to both observation and bombardment squadrons. The rear cockpit was equipped with one or two machine guns and dependent on the mission flown, it might also carry a camera, bomb sight, or wireless set for sending messages. After long, dreary months of combating both the enemy and the infamous French mud, the men on the front were elated when they learned that the fighting would stop on November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m. Now they could go home and pick up where they left off. The men who returned were greeted with a tumultuous welcome from throngs of proud fellow Americans. A few were received as special heroes. Long to be remembered would be men such as Billy Mitchell, who directed America's combat effort in the air, and Eddie Rickenbacker, America's ace of aces. But some men, such as the legendary Raoul Lufberry, who died while attacking a German two-seater, would never return. They would remain in France, resting in the soil of the nation where they had made the supreme sacrifice.